Hi everyone, I'm Janus and a very warm welcome back to this week's very special edition of the Unknown Radio Show, Broken Silence, The Steve Pierce Story. I've been very fortunate enough to link up with Steve himself recently and I'm absolutely delighted to present you all now the following production exclusively here for the first time. For those unfamiliar with Steve and his part in the world famous alien abduction incident of Travis Walton that happened on November the 5th 1975 on their way back from logging to Snowflake Arizona then you're in for a real treat indeed. This is without doubt one of the most known and fascinating cases in ufology and with Hollywood making it into the 1993 film Fire in the Sky. Steve himself has remained silent now for 38 years, choosing only recently to go public for the first time. What you're about to hear now is Steve's version of his story and in his own words. As ever, with the nature of my show, I've composed and recorded some brand new music as well as included past works of mine to form a soundtrack as Steve's tale unfolds. Without further ado, please sit back now, relax and enjoy Broken Silence, the Steve Pierce story. My dad, he, he passed away and was living down in Mesa, uh, Mesa, Arizona. That's where I that's where I grew up. I grew up in Mesa, and my grandparents had bought some land up in Snowflake uh, a couple of years before that. We've been going up and back and forth up there building a cabin with my grandparents. And well, when my dad passed away, my mom moved us up there, and. Uh, we were living outside of Snowflake. We had no electricity, no running water. We had to um, um, get our own firewood and stuff from the stove and everything. And we lived out there for the summer. And at nighttime, we could go out back, and there was a, a mountain behind us. and. You could sit there and watch these UFOs just flying around. And at the time, we really didn't know what, what it was. And But you could go out back at night and watch them fly around, make all different kinds of signs in the sky, go stop, and then turn this way and then turn that way. And, and we used to sit there and watch it. Well, winter was coming, and... And so we moved back into, we moved into town and um, we had running water. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> well, anyway, um, uh, I went to work for Mike. I had a, an uncle and a cousin that was working for Mike Rogers and they got me the job and, and I, I knew of Travis for like a year or so before this happened. I didn't hang out with him. You know, I would go up there when we went to Snowflake and stuff, we'd, we'd see him and stuff. And when I didn't hang out with none of them because I was, I was 17 and everybody else was in their 20s. And I think Mike was even older than that. I think he was closer to 30. And so my mom wasn't gonna let me hang out with these guys. but. We went to work like anybody else does. Let's go to work. And, and uh, my uncle and cousin, they quit. And another guy, three guys quit at the same time. And so we was getting behind on the contract. And then John Goulet, uh, Mike Rogers' brother-in-law, he came up from, the, up from Phoenix. And he had a, a guy with him named Dwayne Smith. And they hired on with us. So it was uh, 
Mike Rogers, he was driving. Uh, Kenny Peterson was in the middle, and Travis Walton was on the far right in the front seat. He was Travis was on the shark fin side. In the back seat was Alan Dallas, then me, John Goulet, and Dwayne Smith was on the far left behind Mike. Well, we loaded up for the day. We we uh we took off. We seen this. I think it was Alan that saw first. Saw some light through the trees. And we couldn't figure out what it was. And somebody said, "Look like the moon." And no, there's the moon over here on on the other side here. It's not the moon. And then someone said it might be a. a a wrecked airplane, and John Gillette said, "No, I know what an airplane wreck looks like. It's it's not an airplane wreck." But we couldn't really tell what it was, but it was this bright white coming through the trees. And as we made this one little turn, Alan Dallas says, "It's a spaceship." And he he hits the floorboard, and kind of the more he gets back up, but he's still looking out the window, the floorboard. As we're coming around, and I scoot all the way over to the to the door, so I have a real close view. And then Mike stops, and because um, Alan Dallas on there, it's a UFO, it's a spaceship, it's a spaceship. Um, and Mike stops, and Travis gets out, and to me, he looks like he was. In a trance, and just people were hollering at him. And he turned around once, and this gave us this weird, strange look, and and started walking towards it. And then um, he he ducked down in between these dead trees. And when he stood back up, this thing's hovering in the air. It's solid white. It's not moving. It's just hovering there. All of a sudden, it started. Rocking back and forth, it had a beeping noise to it, then a, a, a loud pitching noise, and then all of a sudden this blue light, bluish green light came out and zapped Travis in the chest. And Travis flies back about 15 feet. He hits the ground, and I can see him hit the ground, and, and his uh, body kind of like bounces, and then he just stops. He's not moving. I hollered out, "They got him!" As soon as I said, "They got him," Mike Rogers takes off. We're running all over, over pine trees and everything else, man. Mike wasn't missing a gear, and we get down a ways, and and right before we get to the main dirt road, Kenny Peterson gets him to stop, and and we all get out. As we're getting out, we see this this uh, white, bright light um, cross go across the sky. It went up, like north, northeast, and we were getting out, and and uh, everybody's hollering and screaming at each other, and can't figure out. You know, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. And Kenny Peterson goes, you know, we need to go back and we need to go look for him. John goes, yeah, we have to go back and we look for him. And then uh, I think it was Dwayne Smith says, no, he was disintegrated. And, and I said, no, I seen him hit the ground. His body is there. I know he's there. His body is there. But I was thinking he was dead. And so we all decided to go back and look for him. We all got back in the pickup, and we went back and we looked for him. And, We couldn't. We had one flashlight, and we couldn't find him. We looked everywhere. He was hollering his name and everything. We couldn't find him. And we looked and looked and looked, and he wasn't there. Now we're trying to figure out what we should do now. Should we go call the cops? We go to town, get some people to get a posse, come out here and help us look for him, you know? And, and uh, Kenny. Said, you know, we need to call the cops. And me and Alan Dallas, we weren't too crazy about calling the cops. We knew the cops were going to believe us. They weren't too crazy about the four in the back seat, anyway. And so 
Um, we go into Heber, and the first phone booth we come to is is a telephone substation, and there's two phone booths hooked up at this building. And Kenny gets out, and Mike's still upset because when we were up there looking for for Travis, Mike falls down to his knees and and says, "Oh, I left my best friend behind me, and I left my best friend behind." And, and he was really upset. So when we got back down the call, Kenny did call the cops, but he didn't tell the cops that what happened. He just said, "You know, I got a missing person." And so we went out to the main highway where the where the uh, gas station was at, and sit out there, and we waited for him because Heber's a small town. And uh, the first one that showed up was a. Was a city cop I think and then a deputy sheriff showed up and then Gillespie the, the, the sheriff the county sheriff showed up and we were telling him what, what, what happened and everything and he thought we were drinking beers or partying or something or or you know and he got each of us alone and talked to us and then then he says well I want I want uh, Mike Rogers has to go back because he's the crew boss and I want two other people to go back. And so Kenny Peterson and John, uh, Alan Dallas, they they went back with the cops. Me, Dwayne Smith, and uh, um, John Goulet took Mike's pickup back home, back to Snowflake, and John Goulet drove the pickup. Well, the next morning, uh, they still ain't found Travis and they're getting, the cops are getting this posse together and they're going to go out and look for him and uh, there's people at my, at the door talking to my mom and telling my mom, you know, we think Travis is dead and we're going to go out there and find a body and everything. So I snuck out the back door and grabbed my boots and my hat and snuck out the back door and I hid all day. I went to a, a girlfriend's house. And I was hiding in the bedroom when her mother came home for lunch and her mother was telling her that, you know, you gotta stay away from that Pierce boy. The whole town thinks they killed Travis. And when she left and and uh, um, she came back in the bedroom, I thought she was gonna make me leave, but she let me stay until her mom came home. But her mom came home later on that night. And then, um, I sneak back home and it's dark and and uh, they still haven't found Travis. My mom says, says someone came by and said the cops were out there looking for him, but they never did find him. And then I'm lying there the next morning and trying to sleep, tossing and turning. The sun's coming up and I notice there's people looking through my window. And there's a news reporter taking pictures. He was looking through my window taking pictures. And I go outside and there's all these people out there. People came from all over the world. Within a couple of days, people just came from everywhere. And they were chasing us and trying to get our pictures and every move we make, there was somebody there asking us all kinds of questions, you know. And so I, I, did, I did a lot of hiding. And then um, I was going in the back way, trying to stay out of sight. And the city cop pulled me over and and uh, told me to get in the back of his cop car. And I get back there and we went, we went for a little ride. And he was telling me that that um, in Arizona you don't need a a body to be convicted for murder. And if I'm involved in it, I'm just as guilty as the person who did the killing. So, you know, if I confess right now and, and tell him what happened, that, you know, he, he, they would be on my side, you know, try to help me out. But if I don't confess, you know, and they find out later, I'm just as guilty as they are and you're going to go to jail for murder. Well, I told the cop, you know, what, what we told him was true, and well, he let me out, and he told me to think about it and let him know, you know. And I was thinking, well, 
there's nothing really to think, you know. <laughs> and so, um, they got still all kinds of people out there looking for Travis on the second day. I think they had a helicopter out there looking for him, but it wasn't it wasn't as big as it wasn't big as the first one. Well, I told my mom what happened that night when I got home, and she just looked at me like, you know, she really didn't believe me. She thought I was maybe pulling a trick on her or something, and it didn't, it really didn't hit to her until the next morning when the cops were at the door telling my mom that Travis is dead out there somewhere, and, and they're going to go out there and find the body, you know. So that, then she really started, you know, started sinking in. Well, on the third day, um, they were talking, I think it was the third day, they were, they were talking about making us take a polygraph test. And nobody really wanted to take it. And so then Alan Dallas's mom was starting to say, tell us, you know, um, they're going to set this polygraph test up and make us look guilty. And so we decided to take the polygraph test. And they did. I really didn't want to take it. So the morning of the polygraph test, I, I tried to sneak out the back door again, you know, to hide from the cops and everything. But this time they were waiting on me. And they put me in my mom's car. And my mom had to take me because I was a minor. My mom had to be there. And plus my mom was kind of curious if we killed Travis, you know. <laughs> So my mom took me to the Holbrook to the county where the county uh, sheriff's office was at, about 20, 30 miles from where we lived. And we get there, I mean, there's, I mean, there's news of people everywhere, cameras everywhere, people just running up to us asking microphones in their hands and, you know, asking us all kinds of questions. And they finally get us in the courthouse and they, uh, they take us down to the, uh, uh, I believe it was, we did it in, in, the, in their lunchroom, you know, the polygraph test. And they were, they were um, telling us before what we we're going to say and, you know, what they were going to say and tell us about the polygraph test and everything. And everybody was getting kind of nervous because we're starting to realize, you know, this ain't about a missing person, this is about a murder. They're trying to hang a murder on us now, you know, it's all starting to really sink in here, you know, and um, we're thinking, I'm, I, I was thinking that, you know, we're, we, we come up guilty on this polygraph test, we ain't leaving this jailhouse, you know, I knew it, and so they talked to us for a while, and then they, Gus came in there and looked at me and says, because I wasn't saying a word, I never said a word where everybody else was talking. You know, my dad taught me that it comes to cops and they're accusing you of something, you keep your mouth shut, you know. And that's what I was exactly doing, was keeping my mouth shut. And and they walked up to me and said, well, we'll take the quiet one first, you know. And I was, well, you know, so. Um, they took me first because they figured since I was 17 that I would have cracked before they strapped me together and confessed everything, you know. So they were thinking that I was going to crack, and they put me in the polygraph test chair, and they hooked me all up, and they asked me a question: Did I do body harm to Travis? Do I know anybody did body harm to Travis? Is Travis buried out there somewhere? And one of the other questions: Did we actually see a UFO? They asked us if we saw a spaceship, and we passed. We passed the polygraph test, and the sheriff couldn't believe it. He thought, you know, we were all lying, and Gillespie still believes to this day this was a hoax. Well, that night, we went home, and my mom was relieved that we didn't kill Travis, but Travis was still gone. And um, the next morning, still hiding from the news reporters, and and waiting on to see what the news is going to come on about the polygraph test, you know. And, and I take off for the day and go into hiding and come back that night. And my mom says, Travis is back. He's in a Tucson hospital somewhere. 
But actually, he wasn't. He just, everybody just thought he was in the Tucson hospital because that's the rumor his brother let out. And so everybody's thinking he's at the hospital, but he's back, he's alive. And I looked at my mom and I says, I told you we didn't kill him. <laughs> and then I didn't see Travis for, I don't know, maybe three months, maybe a month. I'm not sure, about three weeks anyway. Um, um, he came back up to Snowflake and we all met him at Mike's house. And he told us the story and we believed him. I mean, it was something about his eyes. His eyes were, were different after that. His eyes are still different after that. And we believed him. And we, after that, we kind of like went, all, went our, our separate ways for a while. We stayed away from each other for a long time. And some of them I still ain't seen for 35 years, 38 now, 38 years ago, two days ago. 38 years ago today, people were, were uh, chasing me down taking my picture, taking me, doing interviews, trying to get me to do interviews, and I wouldn't do them because when I seen a camera, I would run the other way. I didn't want the cameras in my face. I didn't like that. I didn't like it. Um, I, I just, it, it just, it just totally freaked me out. I mean, I can think about it right now and, and being, I can remember this day 38 years ago today, like it was yesterday. The way people treated us, people were looking at us like we we killed Travis. People were saying, said, what'd you do with Travis? What'd you do with Travis? You know, where's Travis's body at? And the whole town thought we murdered him. And you got all these news reporters um, looking at us and you got all these cops. Cops everywhere, everywhere we went, somebody was following us. You know, we, the, um, uh, I mean, it, it really, for five days, it got crazy. I mean, five days, 38 years ago today, was a bad day. <laughs>
in an extraordinary music career spanning over 30 years, composer and multi-instrumentalist Janus has delighted us with his UFO-themed works. From his exploration of the Roswell crash with his 1998 award-winning album, to his sonic journeys of the Kenneth Arnold incident, the Rendlesham story, and beyond. All available music by Janus can be found at his official music website. Go to janus.soundfuturesdirect.com. Janus, expanding the frontiers of music and the history of ufology. We pick up again now in the second part of Steve Pierce's incredible story as he tells us how Travis Walton described the interior of the alien spacecraft to him following his return from the abduction by it. something over him and it kind of freaked him out. He jumps up, he grabs for this tube and thinks it's glass and he tries to break it, but it don't break, so he's swinging at them. And I believe they were three of them and they were grays. And the grays uh, went down a hallway that forked. They went one way, so he went another after they left. He went inside this room that had a chair in the middle. And uh, uh, he could see the universe, um, and there was on the chair was all kinds of knobs and stuff, and he was kind of like messing with the knob, and you know, the room would go in a circle, like you know, he could see the stars, and I guess he was in the pilot's room, and a uh, pilot's chair, and and then somebody that looked like us, that was in an astronaut uniform, came in there and took him by the hand led him into another another uh, craft and that's all he can remember. Well, it, it was it was solid white. It was like a white I've never seen. And I've seen UFOs before that and after and, and after. I've seen a lot of UFOs. It's been in my life, all my life, you know, it, it's it's part of my life. I believe once you start seeing them, you'll see them for the rest of your life. There's a reason why they're there. And this was, it was like two cake pans on top of each other. And, but it was solid white. That's how it was shaped. And you could see the window frames coming down from the craft. They looked like window frames. You could, I couldn't see nobody in the windows. But you could just see like a frame coming outside the craft and, and, and then one piece all the way in the middle coming across. And it was solid white. It was beautiful. The beam was like a bluish green color. It came out and it kind of like beat out. Uh, it was smaller at the beginning, then it kind of beat, got kind of bigger, and and it lit up the whole sky. And I don't believe Travis felt that. It was like, you know, you, you don't see the bullet that gets you. Well, that's what I believe. I don't believe Travis because it happened too fast and he was out. So, um, it was beautiful, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And then when he got zapped, it got brighter and brighter and brighter. This UFO got really, really, really bright, um, right before it zapped him. It turned out to be like a joke. Uh, the whole town thought it was a joke then, thought it was all lying, you know. It turned out to be a big joke. and. And then um, I got married that following February, and I moved to a town. I didn't even invite none of these guys to the wedding. Not one of these guys came to my wedding because I was trying to stay away from them. And then I moved to Taylor, 
And when I moved to Taylor, I, uh, there was a city cop named Jim Click. He came to my door one day and told me that Philip Glass said he'd give me $10,000 to say it was a hoax. And then I asked Jim Click, you know, is that all you wanted? And he goes, yeah. He says, he says Philip Glass says, get a hold of him and he'll give you $10,000. You say this was a hoax. And what? I, at the time, I always thought Philip Glass was a news reporter, and I always did until a couple years ago when I got back into this. Travis was telling me some things about him, but anyway, um, at the time, I just blew it off. I just didn't really think of it, you know, because I was hiding from reporters, and I really, you know, I even hid from you can. There's a, a National Star gave them some money. National Choir, you know, it was National Choir, gave him some money, and they got a picture of him all holding the checks, well, I'm not in the picture, you know, it's, I didn't want to be, you know, it, it's hard to explain, it just really freaked me out afterwards, you know, so, well, I was just staying away from everybody, and and to me, being in the spotlight, that wasn't just me. I, don't, I, I didn't like the spotlight. And so I stayed away from him. And when Philip Class offered me that money, I just blew it off. Because, you know, I, I didn't like my name in the paper and everything. And um, my family thought we were all nuts and thought either that was from the devil or something. And so. I moved to Texas after that, went back home where, my, where I was born, where my mom was from, and Phil Glass found out my address out there and got my phone number and started calling me about once a month, telling me that, that you know, um, um, you say this is a hoax, I gave you $10,000 and all this, you know, so, I um, hung up the phone one night and told the wife, I says, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and just take that money. I mean, it's the 70s, we got three kids, and $10,000 is a lot of money, and nobody believes us anyway. You know, they think this is all nothing but a hoax. And, and she looked at me and she says, do you believe this really happened? And I says, yeah, I really believe this really happened. And she says, you're going to sell yourself out for some money because you're mad at Mike because I was mad at Mike because Mike had never paid me for the job and then we got into a after that happened um, he took another side job for me from me so I wasn't too happy with Mike and and everybody thought we was lying anyway so let's go ahead and uh, take this money so she was totally against it and one night he called and she wasn't home and I told him, I said, well, what do I need to do to say this is a hoax? You know, how do I get the money? And Philip Glass is the only person I ever said it was a hoax to because I had to say that to get the money because I was, I was the one that was the money. And, well, he flew out to Texas, to Fort Worth, and we met at a restaurant, and he was telling me that we need to go back to Arizona. Well, I need to go back to Arizona. And, and look for some stuff, you know, so we can prove this is a hoax. And he says, you need to find a generator or something. I said, well, you're gonna need an awful big generator. If you're gonna get that bright white that was. <laughs> you're gonna need more than one generator. <laughs> he just looks at me. He says, well, you need to go back and, 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 and find something. So we talked for a while and he left and and uh, I went back home, and a couple nights later, I told Mike's wife what I did, and uh, she told me, well, you know, I'm not gonna spend this money. This is wrong, you know. We just need, we just need to stop it. We just need to start avoiding me. And he says, he, she told me, she says, your day will come. Your day will come. So I started avoiding them again, and after that, we moved up to, to uh, Utah. And um, I was had this job, and so 
Somebody called. I don't know if this is still a class or not, but I'm pretty sure it was. Someone called up there at my job looking for me and um, saying that, you know, I want to talk to me about a, an incident that happened in Arizona. And I figured, you know, it had to be him. Well, when that job was done, I went back to Arizona, back to Mesa, back to Phoenix, down in the valley. And then the ex-wife, we got divorced. And I was staying at my brother's house and his brother and his wife's house. And Philip Class found out their number and started calling them and telling them, you know, tell Steve I'll give him ten thousand dollars if he says this is a hoax and all this, you know. So after that, I just took off and started driving truck. Went started driving cross country a couple years later and stayed out there and stay away from them. And then after that, I started having my own. Um, dealings with them. It started and it's never stopped. In 93 and 94, I was in a, a truck stop in Barstow, California. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, 1, one 2 o'clock, I don't know, it's late, it's early. Um, I was getting fuel, I just weighed my wagon, got fuel, and I went to the, the fuel, the, the, the paying for my fuel, and I, and I paid for my fuel, the fuel gas, and I went to the bathroom, and you know, as I was coming out, um, I went in the TV room to see if anybody was going to drive for the rest of the night. So I walk into the TV room and there's Travis Walton on HBO talking about the movie Fire in the Sky. And that's how um, I knew they made a movie. I was, I was a day and a half early for my load once I saw that. I never stopped when I got to New Orleans. <laughs> uh, well, Henry Thomas plays my part in the movie. I think his name's Craig. Greg or Greg, I don't know. I've only seen the movie a couple times, but I know Henry Thomas, the the little boy who plays E.T. In the movie E.T., he plays my part in the movie. He's the kid, Henry Thomas is the kid in the movie. Well, Travis said they couldn't find me. Well, they didn't use John Goulet's name either, and John Goulet got paid for the movie, and they still didn't. Use his name, Kenny Peterson. They changed his name. Um, Dwayne Smith. They took him completely out of the movie. So you know, Hollywood can do what they want once they buy that script, I guess. Part of the the movie is true, okay? But like, um, like the incidents that I'm reading, um, National Enquirer and. and and we're driving down the truck, we're in the pickup and Alan Dallas hits me in the head and Travis protects me, you know, gets involved in it. And that part, part of that is true, but the part about me reading that, that reading the National Choir ain't what started the fight, you know. So they mixed the things in with things that were kind of true, but they changed it a little bit, you know what I mean? And, um, I don't know, I'd say the most of the movie is wrong. It's all Hollywood. The part about the tree falling down, and Travis, that part's true. I was there, I saw that. You know, Alan Dallas, the, the day that this happened, Alan Dallas is cutting down a tree and it almost hits Travis, you know. And Travis thought he did it on purpose, but I always thought it was an accident. That part's true, but a lot of the movie isn't true. Um, like uh, what James Garner, is that his name? The guy that plays the sheriff. Um, he's playing like two or three parts in one, you know? And, 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 and Gillespie didn't come up from, from the valley to do this. He, he, he was in Holbrook, he was the county sheriff, you know? You see what I'm saying? So they changed it and did it their way, you know? And part of uh, the UFO goes, they ain't what it looked like. It was solid white. I mean, they made it look like some kind of volcano 
all red looking thing, you know? You know what I mean? And the part about Mike going back by himself, that kind of, that, that what really pissed me off about the movie. You know, they, they portrayed Mike as uh, being the tough guy in all this, you know? <laughs> that ain't what happened. <laughs> I was disappointed in the light from the movie because it looked like they just put a spotlight on him and that was it. They they more they put more special effects in the UFO and they did the did the uh, the zapping part, you know. But if you watch a film called Paranormal Witness, it was on the Sci-Fi Channel. It comes on Wednesday nights. If you we were on it last year. It's called the abduction. If you see this, this has Gillespie in it. The other cops in it. Um, the guy that did the polygraph test, the doctors, me, Kenny, John Goulet, everybody's in this. This is the best one. If you want to see a good one, watch that. Gillespie still believes this was a hoax. The sheriff, to this day, he believes we, we, we put one on, over on the law enforcement. <laughs> it is amazing, isn't it? In 2009, I fell off a load and broke my neck, and my neck is, um, You know, the three, four, five, six, seven vertebrae is all one piece now. And um, I was sitting at home healing and after the surgery and we got the movie Fire in the Sky. And I was telling my daughter, Henry Thomas, that's me. My daughter goes, well, um, your name is different. How come they changed your name? I said, I don't know. So I got a hold of Travis and told, you know, and um, Travis sent me the book, and my name's in the book, and pictures in the book, and everything. And, and Travis's book, and um, he sent her a, a poster. Travis getting zapped, and then a couple other things. And she believes. And then she got telling me that you know you need to go out and start talking about this. And I was thinking about it anyway because. If, if I don't come out and talk about it, somebody else will. And they will tell a story about me that didn't happen. Like in the movie, it shows me going back out there with the posse and, and looking for Travis the next day. That didn't happen. You really think I'm going to go out there with a bunch of cops looking for a dead body? Come on, you don't know me very well. How are you going to run from a hundred cops? There's no way in hell I would have went out there. They would have had to drag me to get me out there. You know, I stayed hidden. I thought Travis was dead. I thought they were going to come after us for murder, and they did. And, you know, just like the polygraph test, I didn't want to go do that because I just knew they they were going to um, make us look guilty. You know, today I'm glad they made me, you know, because we, we all passed it, and I'm glad I did it. But at the time, I didn't, I didn't want to do it. Um, I believe they're all connected in a, in, in a way. There's a reason why they're here. I'll tell you one. I, I was um, going down the highway. I was in New Mexico and I was going up Route 666. Uh, they changed to 491 now because people didn't like the, the 666, the Mark of the Beast highway, I guess. And, and I was heading towards Shiprock, New Mexico, up by Cortez. Oh, we're down from Cortez. But um, I was heading that way, and I noticed there was a bright light behind me. And then it got up right on top of me. And, it's, and I'm thinking, oh, here we go again, you know. So there was a gas station that was closed and I pulled into it and I got out of the semi you know how semis got steps get it up into it I was standing on the semi looking up and it was right above me it was just hovering there and I looked down the highway and I seen these headlights coming and I looked back up and I looked back down to see where the headlights were at and the next thing I remember it's the next morning and they're beating on my semi, telling me that 
you can't park here, they're fixing to open the store up, you've got to move your semi. So I had like four hours missing. I was hypnotized a while back by Yvonne Smith, I mean, she's done it five times since January, and a couple of things came out then that that I was abducted that night, and that, um, but I, I don't want to talk about that yet, that's still, you know, we're still working on that, Yvonne Smith. They, they, we came out with some stuff I didn't know, and the first time they did it was all about fire in the sky, and I kind of freak out, but, but the last ones were about me and about things that happened to me. You know, nowadays it's a little bit different. Uh, back then they thought you were nuts, crazy, or whatever, you know, and, but now people are starting to deal with it. The people who come to the conferences, they believe, you know, I've, I've got a couple of people that showed up to a few of them that were non-believers, but the majority of people who come in to listen, you know, believe. But it, you know, it's just like if I walked into a grocery store and, and, and told my story to the guy at the cash register, he'd probably think I was nuts, you know. Before, uh, I was really careful who I told my story to before I came out, but now I don't care. I tell everybody, believe me, no, I don't care. Well, right now I'm retired. I'm, I'm trying to rewrite my book. I wrote one and sold a few of them, but we're gonna do something different. And try to get my book out here in a few more months, but I've been going to conferences with Travis. We're doing pretty good. I think that's, to me, that's, that's, that's therapy, going to the conferences, going to these people that come there and listen to you, listen to you, uh, listen to you speak. It, this was a long time ago, and it's time to, to come out, all of us, all, everybody who's involved. Alan Dallas passed away a couple years ago. We all need to get together at least one more time before we all, you know, be, people back then, it was really bad. Now there's more believers, but you still got your critics. I mean, there's still people out there that think we're, you know, I got a brother that still doesn't believe. You know, he thinks this is not, nothing but a hoax. You know, the ones who believe will believe you, and the ones who don't, they're awful hard on you. hope you enjoy Broken Silence, the Steve Pearce story, here on the Unknown Radio Show, as much as I have put it all together. I'd just like to say an enormous thanks to Steve on behalf of myself, the listeners, and in fact everyone as absorbed in this incident as I've been since it happened back in 1975. I know breaking his silence and going public with his version of events after so many years couldn't have been an easy choice to make. But we can be thankful that he has done and continues to fly the flag and tell the world how it happened. So again, a big thanks to Steve Pearce. Steve also has a brand new official website, so please do go check that out and keep up to date with all of his news. And you can find that at stevepearce.soundfuturesdirect.com Until next week, I look forward to you all joining me again here, where my own search for answers into the unexplained and unknown continues and with more musical creations from me to guide us on our way. So until then, as ever, you all remember to look after yourselves, as importantly, one another, and remember that the dream doesn't remain the same. It simply gets better and better. I'm Janus. Good night, everyone.